Υπάρχουν φοιτήτριες, φοιτητές μέσα στην αίθουσα για... Are there any students uh, in the theater? Κάνουν γάλοπ. Well, there is a... We're just... Uh, are you colleagues, researchers? I don't know. Do we have any visitors? People uh, that... Uh, are not members of uh, Pandion University. Oh, it's you, uh, from Turkey. Oh, excellent. Okay. That's what I've done here. What I've done here, I don't know. Αγαπητές και αγαπητοί φοιτητές. Dear uh, friends, dear colleagues, dear researchers, students, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, visitors of uh, Pandion University for this event, and all of you that follow us uh, via live streaming, uh, the, this uh, discussion in which I am the coordinator is part of a three-day meeting academia for the universal basic income. Uh, all this event and the organization is under, is under the auspices of uh, the a universal uh, basic income uh, of Europe, Greece, uh, Pantheon University and Freiburg University. We are members uh, of the teaching staff in social policy 
one of the three departments of Greek universities uh, that uh, social policy is its subject. subject. Mrs. Kuluri, the rector and the president of the department, uh, Lesbina Papadopoulou, could not be here today, unfortunately. I will uh, be there to welcome you to Pantheon University. I would like to welcome our foreign speakers uh, that have come from abroad to participate in this uh, three-day conference and uh, visitors uh, that in these conditions of uh, pandemic and uh, flu uh, came uh, to attend uh, live uh, this event. Uh, hopefully all of you that are following us via live streaming have no difficulties in uh, hearing us or uh, seeing us. Uh, the discussion uh, of today's meeting are policies for a sustainable future. For all of you who just followed such an event for the first time, universal basic income uh, or uh, unconditional basic income is a radical political uh, proposal for this sustainable uh, future all of us uh, seek. Let's me, let me say some basics. When we talk about universal basic income, we talk about a basic income that offers uh, citizens a basic security and is paid as a universal right. It is uh, offered uh, to all members of the society. It, uh, the basic uh, income is suggested by its supporters as a tool that achieves multiple objectives. What are these objectives? Uh, financial security, in uh, a society full of uncertainties, decrease of uh, financial and social inequalities and poverty in a society of the last decades, in a liberal uh, model of capitalism, it, the so social inequalities have increased and poverty as well. Another objective is uh, the assurance of a job, last but not least, objective is the expansion of freedom of people with regard to choices of labor and vis-a-vis -vis state control, which we see in the last decade, social policy field, imposes requirements and controls uh, people if they have the requirements in order to get the, uh, benefits from the welfare uh, state. Uh, so with these objectives, uh, universal basic income uh, is linked uh, to most of social objectives of uh, agendas, uh, agenda of the United Nations for Sustainable Development Goals. That is, uh, in our discussion today, we will try to convey uh, the message or uh, the discussion in another field, not uh, to link that uh, with uh, the goals of uh, sustainable uh, development, uh, but link this proposal for a sustainable future with the goals linked to ecological balance and uh, sustainability. In our discussion today, we will talk about uh, the alternatives, uh, about a sustainable future, because universal basic income is not uh, the only proposal on the table discussed by activists 
or political parties, uh, social organizations, initiatives of civil society, etc. So it's not the only proposal. And it is important to see how this uh, proposal uh, is part uh, of other alternatives alternative proposals uh, for a sustainable future. Is it complementary, controversial? And when uh, this uh, discussion ends, to have uh, a clearer uh, uh, picture about the dialogue existing in civil society, political parties around these uh, proposals, especially parties that seek an alternative uh, in this globalization, uh, globalized uh, liberalism. We see that uh, capital after the crisis of 2008 did not succumb. It was not uh, controlled by the states or uh, international community but it still prevails organ uh, creating problems or even uh, similar or even worse than those that led us to the crisis of 2008 with these uh, words uh, i want to come uh, to the speakers of uh, today's panel to say that we have provided uh, or the organizers have provided for three speakers. Unfortunately, we have two because Mr. Akritor uh, Arsenis, MP from uh, DM25 uh, party, couldn't be with us. He is ill. So he asked us to just uh, inform you about that. So we will start uh, uh, with my, our first uh, speaker, Gabriella Cabagna. And then I will give the floor to my dear colleague, uh, Costas Dimoulas. Gabriela Campagna is an anthropologist, uh, a researcher of the Long London School of Economics and Political Science and member of the Chilean Network for Basic uh, Income. Gabriela, you've got uh, 10 minutes for your thoughts on our discussion. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, introduction, uh, Maria, and thanks everyone present here tonight. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm going to put out some points that I would like to go back to perhaps later in the debate with the, with the audience and with um, the other person in the panel. So um, when invited to uh, talk about a sustainable future, I, I personally, like the point I want to make today is that for me, talking about a sustainable future, about, about an ecologically sound future, means talking about degrowth. And I know this might be controversial, and it's not a very uh, popular or politically appealing term, but I want to explain why. Um, because starting from the point of the need of degrowth means in, uh, rec recognizing our wider ecological overshoot and recognizing the problematic of consumerism and productivism as at the root uh, of our uh, current ecological problem. We already produce more than enough to support everyone's well-being, and much of what we do is not even designed for our well-being. And here I'm thinking about key issues we face today, other than uh, global warming, such as food waste, uh, speculation in housing, uh, fast fashion, etc. Therefore, uh, what we need more than improving efficiency, which is uh, the usual take of green growth, for instance, is changing the way we live and focusing more on sufficiency rather than efficiency, putting this as our horizon. Now, having that in mind, uh, how does this converge with basic income? So we know from multiple evidence and trials on basic income already a lot about the impacts, uh, individual impacts of basic income. Um, we know how it changes the way we make decisions, the way we feel and think about ourselves, and I think this is all very good, but I want to point to a wider impact that basic income can have, um, and it can have in the support of, of degrowth. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Um, so in particular, I want to focus on how basic income could change the way we work, 
the way uh, we practically organize work and also the meaning we give to work in our societies. So I, I have a feeling that there is a general um, sense that humans have like a disposition to be productive and a disposition to work. And I want to suggest that um, there is no such disposition. And there is not in the sense that there is no uh, imperative or natural um, relevance of, or uh, preeminence of labor as the ultimate way of acting in society. There are many other ways in which humans can act in society that are meaningful and valuable, that are not necessarily work. But we, we usually, in, in our uh, work-centered societies that probably most of us inhabit, this, this uh, tends to be the case. But we can extrapolate this to our uni something like a, un a universal, universal human nature. So we need to avoid the crucial mistake of reducing all forms of creative human energies into labor. And now how, um, how changing work could help breaking away from productivism? I'm going to just mention two practical examples, one of them from evidence and one of them of um, a talent, a situation that we need to focus. So the first one is uh, from the, the research I'm familiar with, uh, how basic income could, for instance, change the way in which we do agriculture. Our current uh, agri-food system is extremely uh, damaging, it's extremely destructive of nature. And having a basic income and having the financial security of a basic income could make the use of land less dependent on, on the financiarization of food uh, global systems and make uh, farmers depend less on things like fertilizers or the use of fossil fuels um, that, it, that happens today. And this is, this is evident, uh, for instance, from pilots in, in India that show that when farmers have a regular, a modest basic income, they can afford to work their own land. And arguably, we could say they, they could also have more space to experiment with less fossil fuel and, and less uh, ecologically toxic ways of growing food. And there are also similar evidence from uh, conditional cash transfer programs in Latin America. This idea of the power to say no to certain impositions in how people working the land actually get to grow their food and how they could um, open, open to a different um, system of food production. And then the second challenge that I think speaks very, very deeply into degrowth is the idea of ending with sacrifice zones. I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but um, in Latin America, at least, we talk a lot about sacrifice zones to talk about places and ecosystems that have been destroyed by extractive and polluted indust polluting industries. Uh, in, in decades, and also like in the making, it's a process of, of sacrificing people and land. And in such places, um, dependency often from corporations, large, corp large corporations, transnational corp corporations, comes mostly from regular wages. The wages are not always, or mostly, very high, but they are regular wages. And for many people, just having that security in, in, a, in a regular income makes them extremely dependent on these destructive activities, so breaking from that dependency becomes very hard. So if, if we already have those things happening, why not change that dependency from um, a predatory corporation into a, a more democratic, mutual form of dependency, which is basic income. Now, like we, we could say it's, a, it's another form of, of promising each other that, that regular um, wage, but it wouldn't be a wage, obviously. Um, so people can say no, they have, again, the power to say no to things that they clearly see and know are destroying their lives and livelihoods. People are aware of what's happening, but they can't reject that uh, very um, precarious employment that this industries bring to their territories. And these, these considerations, these ecological considerations for basic income, have to make us think about very practical consequences when we think about how we advocate and how we frame basic income. And I just want to mention two. I, um, I think like one key, that, that, like one clue that this gives to how we could advocate for basic income is to, is to uh, think it in, in, the sense, in the term of a conservation income. If you're not familiar with, with the term, it was propor, proposed by Fletcher and, and Buscher, who work in conservation and in transforming conservation as a way of providing a basic income to people living in places uh, threatened by biodiversity loss. So what if we would start 
implementing basic income precisely in these places, in these sacrifice zones or otherwise places that could become sacrifice zones rather than uh, starting with all forms of focalization. Like I think this would be an interesting proposal. And the second one that maybe we can, I think this, this will probably come up in the conversation later is how we fund basic income. Because I'm often worried that uh, if we're gonna fund and bring the money for basic income, for instance, from oil exploitation or from extractive industries like mining, this could end up being, um, you know, like a, what, what's the point, right? Like we are, we are paying um, for basic income in a way that it's damaging ourselves. So we, we should look into that, like how um, the, the sources of finance really have to be ecologically sound. And I think this is again a question more widely about the nature of money and how our monetary systems work today. So it's not just on basic income, but still, I think uh, we also don't, don't talk enough about this. It's not just about taking whatever wealth we have today and splitting it, but actually rethinking how we produce that wealth. So finally, um, I want to insist in the convergence and in the political convergence between basic income and degrowth, because degrowth calls for a reduction and redistribution. Degrowth starts from the idea that we need to recognize that we already have enough. And I think that's, a, that's a, something that resonates with basic income advocates very well. Like, we already have enough wealth, we just need to there tapping and redistributing that wealth into everyone. So I think um, both things can, can really speak nicely to each other. And, and while we redistribute m money, we can also re-channel and rethink the way in which we use our raw materials and energy and the whole ecological metabolism that our societies bring and to put the transformation of that at the center and not as an afterthought. I think it's, um, it's a challenge. So it can, it can allow us to sustain lives that make us happy, not wasteful lives, which is what we sustain now, um, and focus instead of on public provision and what we really need and what we really enjoy. And if I have a... Do I have one more minute? Okay, I just, something that was mentioned also that I, I would like to bring in, it's how important it is to remember that just like degrowth, basic income is a transformative policy in two senses. And I think we often forget one of those senses. It's not that in the sense that if implemented, basic income would allow us to do a number of things and transform many other things that we now can really envision because they are like unexpected um, spillover effects. But also that for happening needs transformation, right? Like we need to transform many things to put basic income in place. It requires rethinking many of, other, of the other institutions of society, among them, as I have said today, work very importantly and money. So if we don't move forward in the transformation of these two things at the same time that we transform basic income, I think um, we would really miss the chance of, of putting the full force of basic income uh, into life. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Gabriella. And I think that the most important thing from what you have said is uh, your conclusion, the two conclusions of yours. First of all, that uh, you linked uh, the uh, alternative proposal from, uh, for ecological uh, sustainability, the degrowth, uh, with uh, the proposal uh, of basic income. And you said that uh, the suggestion for basic income is a requirement uh, or uh, is those uh, preconditions uh, to go to a proposal of degrowth. So it's important uh, that uh, you put uh, two different proposals to talk to each other. And 
And she did not make a very simplistic explanation of the uh, impact of basic uh, income. She told us that things are not easy. It's not uh, uh, something that we can do from one day to the next. Uh, and we need a complementarity of social uh, institutions. Radical changes is the other term to talk about uh, transformation because when we talk about radical proposals, we talk about those that lead uh, to social and economic transformation. This complementarity leads us or to have an holistic approach of things. We cannot progress in one sector alone if we don't have this critical eye and develop other uh, proposals to have institutional changes in other fields that facilitate uh, uh, successes uh, in all measures we put uh, before us. Uh, and now we talk about universal basic income, and with these words I will give the floor to my dearest uh, friend and colleague, Kostadinos uh, Dimoulas, uh, professor in the Department of Social Policy. Uh, thank you. I will speak in English. Before you start, Kostadinos, uh, allow me to uh, ask all those who follow us uh, via the internet to submit their uh, proposals, their questions. I have uh, with us uh, Daniel to collect uh, all your questions. I talk about the questions uh, for the speakers, or if there are any, after the presentation of Costas de Mulas. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. We will have two rounds of questions and answers after the presentation of Mr. de Mulas. Unfortunately, to be alive. And then I will uh, present my uh, argument. Uh, what is the provocation? Uh, well, uh, Gabriela argued that basic income for sure is something that has a crucial uh, role for uh, sustainability and uh, linked this sustainability with uh, the degrowth theory. Uh, but uh, maybe forgot to refer that uh, the growth is not the only sustainable future. There are also other su sustainable future uh, which uh, argue for uh, something different in our uh, root A societies. Another argument for uh, supporting the idea that basic income is uh, uh, crucial for uh, sustainability is that uh, the farmers, the example of farmers, which uh, will change their attitude, will not use fertilizers because they will have some safety, as a basic income will give them safety and some positive motives in their uh, 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 land. But most people in our world live in cities. They are not living in uh, uh, agricultural areas. Nearly 70% of the global population uh, live in uh, large cities. And uh, these people, uh, we are part of these people, uh, are used to consume. And we use the available money we have to consume goods that come in our markets via large corporations, and not only large corporations, 
and uh, there are also activities uh, which uh, give us motives to try to get m more money and consume more uh, products, every kind of product. Uh, so uh, people don't have always uh, good will, uh, good goals, but there are many people that have other motives. Uh, it's not clear to me how a person that is working in Gublin, in a Gublin industry, if uh, he will get a basic income or she will get a basic income, will stop to work in Gublin industry or to work in uh, war industry and so on. And, and these activities are part of our everyday activities of our uh, organization as a uh, society. Uh, so, I am an advocate of uh, basic income, but I am a critical advocate, and I don't think that basic income is a panacea for every one uh, of our problems in our modern societies. Well, now to my presentation. As I said just before, there are many, I have just four different sustainable futures that are uh, argued in the literature. First of all, there is what G20, OECD and EU argue, and they argue that there is another sustainable future will, which will be based on productivism and growth mania, uh, climate change, uh, renewable uh, energy, renewable goods are uh, argued to be the new locomotive for growth and more jobs, not only more profits, but also more jobs. And uh, for new generation, next generation EU, for example, this uh, uh, program, uh, this is a sustainable future. And it, co uh, it contains also uh, uh, various kinds of basic income, minimum income, uh, public provisions of benefits, and so on. Another argue, for a sustainable future is the steady state argument presented by Herman Daly, which is similar to the, the previous one. And this idea is working uh, similar with Kate Thron's uh, donut economy, where uh, what we have as a goal is to keep emissions, carbon emissions, at this level or not to leave them to increase a lot. And this is at the, the global level, not in different societies. So we can buy from poor countries emissions and then there will be a, an equilibrium. And uh, of course, there will be also uh, inequalities. The inequalities will be reproduced. And this is another sustainable future also, but inequal sustainable future. There is the growth, of course, the growth is another argument where uh, I'm not sure that uh, what you said, uh, Gabriela, the growth is less consumerism than a different mode of consumerism, different mode of uh, a different kinds of uh, goods we consume and uh, satisfy our needs. Uh, for sure, uh, the growth means another model, another pattern of consumerism. And uh, consumption and production are the two uh, poles, the two axes of our uh, ways of uh, satisfying our needs. And uh, they are part of the same mechanism for satisfying our uh, needs. So if we have another mode of uh, uh, consumerism, we can have another uh, mode of production. And this is another version of uh, the growth. And there is the last sustainable future argument, which supports that uh, what we have as a task is to reduce radically the emissions, carbon emissions, and also reduce radically the temperature in Earth. On Earth, I'm sorry. This means. Uh, to freeze the planet, to, to reduce the average temperature 
uh, for more than uh, two degrees Celsius, on average, every year. This means that we have to reduce all our activities and reforest the planet. And uh, uh, to stop to consume uh, meat and so on. And this is another version of a sustainable future. Uh, and maybe in all these different sustainable futures, there is a part uh, on uh, universal basic income. Because universal basic income is an income that provides people opportunities to live a decent, a dignity life, but not, uh, does not solve all the problems in our societies. And of course, is not uh, a sufficient precondition to solve the problem of uh, emissions. So let's go quite quickly now. We know that the Club of Rome uh, supported that, uh, argued that sustainability means to abandon exponential growth. This is widely accepted now. And uh, Kate Rotho argued that we can manage it if we will arrange the priorities of growth uh, in the cycle of the donut. Uh, this is uh, more or less uh, resilience and uh, sustainability in this approach is similar to, is uh, identified in, as resilience. And uh, Eloy Loren, uh, uh, a colleague uh, who is working for human development uh, and uh, wrote many books uh, for OECD and, uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, for United Nations Development Program and uh, also for uh, uh, sustainability and uh, human development, not growth, human development. Uh, he argues that resilience is short-term sustainability and sustainability is long-term resilience. That means that if we will rearrange our priorities on consumption and keep a dynamic or a static equilibrium in the consumption at the global level, then our societies can be resilient and uh, be sustainable. And in all this idea, human needs, as also United Nations, uh, connect sus sustainability with uh, social co cohesion for United Nations 17th goal for uh, 2030. Sustainability means human development and human development mean means social cohesion. But not all goals for social cohesion uh, support sustainability. For example, no poverty, zero hunger, affordable energy can be supported by income, by basic income also, but this is not sufficient. The satisfaction of these goals is not a sufficient precondition for retaining the planet, for uh, 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 empower, uh, empowering the views of uh, a sustainable uh, future, for strengthening sustainability. There are also other goals, for example, good health and well-being, decent work and economic growth, responsible production and consumption, which are more strongly connected with sustainability. And I'm, I'm not sure if these goals uh, uh, for sure will be uh, supported uh, and promoted uh, by basic income, because basic income does not change per se uh, the uh, consumption pattern of uh, people maybe facilitates, but is not uh, sufficient to change uh, their attitudes uh, toward consuming certain goals, uh, uh, certain goods. Uh, goods uh, that maybe uh, produce uh, uh, more uh, waste uh, to the planet. Now, there are al alternative proposals for uh, social cohesion and maybe for uh, promoting sustainability. I have uh, distinguished them in uh, four categories, four groups, uh, according to 
or four criteria. There are predistributed uh, programs and policies or redis redistributed. And there are, uh, are also policies that uh, promote productivism and uh, policies that promote consumption or uh, consumerism. Uh, for example, uh, carat employment combined with the generous reduction of official working time and free public services is a predistributive uh, proposal which could uh, help people to satisfy their needs and, and maybe they will produce more useful goods, less uh, polluting uh, uh, the planet if the, uh, uh, the occupation of people is guaranteed by some authorities. Another redistributive uh, proposal is minimum or basic wage combined with free public services or job sharing can uh, promote social cohesion, but I'm not sure that will promote also a sustainable, more uh, healthy planet. There is also the proposal for a minimum wage. Minimum wage focus on consumption as basic uh, minimum uh, income as universal basic income, give more money to people, so increase their uh, purchasing power. And uh, we are not sure that if they are combined with generous reduction of official working time or free public services, uh, will uh, uh, promote uh, the sustainability of our societies and the planet. Maybe it will promote social cohesion, maybe it will reduce inequalities, maybe will reduce extreme poverty, but not if uh, basic income is not at uh, a medium level. For example, if it, it is at the level of uh, Van Parijs proposal at 25% uh, uh, of uh, the per capita available income, this will uh, reduce extreme poverty, but will not reduce the relative poverty and inequality at all. Uh, so what we need is a combination of uh, universal basic income with other activities that uh, uh, will uh, enhance uh, positive uh, motives to people's attitudes and uh, behaviors uh, and in order to change their uh, consumption preferences, and this is not guaranteed uh, by basic uh, income. Well, basic income is uh, a step, but not the end of uh, policies that must be combined to support uh, the promotion of uh, a sustainable uh, planet. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas Dimoulas. I believe that we need to retain something which was mentioned uh, at the end, that the universal uh, income is not a panacea, that uh, radical changes are required and different incentive institution system at a different uh, level in order to have a sustainable future. That is, we are speaking about complementarity. We need a basic uh, uh, income together with other things in place. Uh, and of course, a change in terms of uh, our consuming profile. So I'll get back some, to something which was mentioned earlier, that the current uh, consumption uh, uh, hysteria is produced due to a capitalistic model in place, which was mentioned earlier. And it refers essentially to uh, an attitude which led us to the current situation. 
changes in that sense are very difficult to be achieved. However, this is not impossible if we really wish uh, to move forward without putting forward simply uh, fine solutions. Um, so need, we need to bear that in mind. It requires a good, deep knowledge uh, of what is in place and a deep understanding of the society, of the principles where uh, this production model is based, together with uh, the consumption style complementing the production system. So let us use this as a basis for our discussion. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, feel free. We are all uh, we, we can uh, get two, three uh, questions uh, before we give back the floor to our panelists. Uh, thank you. Daniel, is there somebody on the chat putting forward a question? Okay, no, okay. Thank you, first of all. I would like to thank both speakers. Your name, please. Olga Pateraki from the European Citizens Initiative for uh, the Basic Income. I fully agree with whatever mentioned, and particularly on the way the basic income may assist uh, uh, in changing uh, people's attitude. Uh, and I would like to trigger the discussion by putting forward the following. When we are speaking about uh, basic income, of course this is a step towards more freedom, more equality, improvement of overall improvement of our societies and better distribution of goods, uh, ensuring thus uh, a sustainable future, but uh, this letter requires more. We need to change our values. Uh, we need to change a lot of things. However, we can't do that uh, by expecting uh, everything to change overnight and all together the way the economy operates, the way the society by itself operates. Uh, we can't introduce uh, uh, new values overnight. We may have new policies which eventually in turn may influence all other prerequisites. So this uh, is my concept and I would like to have a feedback from the panelists. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I believe we are very cool and we can get some more uh, questions or rather have a more free uh, discussion. Yeah, I also want to thank you both. And I have a question to you. Um, you said most people live in cities, and there are several causes why it is like this. Um, do you think a universal basic income will change the situation? Okay. Um, I am Joy from Germany. Um, my input is more a, a prompt than a question um, to you, because you said um, there also need to be changes in the money system. If you could elaborate a little bit on that, I would be interested in your thoughts. 
Είμαστε ήδη στις τρεις ερωτήσεις. Three questions by now. So, Gabriela. Well, uh, I would welcome you to uh, ask a question, Costas de Moulas, not answer the questions, because uh, he started discussing the growth as you did. So, on your side, could you uh, discuss uh, the statement of Costas de Moulas? Could you comment this particular point, which is directly connected what, with what you mentioned earlier on the growth? So, Gabriela, you got to answer all three questions, and I'm expecting you either to ask Costas de Moulas a question or comment on Costas de Moulas lecture. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I was, I was expecting for the opportunity to, to uh, give an answer to that because I think we, we have many common starting points and, and maybe the most interesting thing for me and what degrowth brings into the conversation are the kind of questions that we start asking and the places we start looking for the problems as well. So I'm, I'm, also, I'm always uh, curious and this is why I was drawn by degrowth when we think about you know, the economy, this object, right, that doesn't really exist, as producing things for our needs. And that's not really true. When you start looking at what the stuff we circulate around us and how we provide for, for services, this is not the case for almost anything, right? Like, if, we, if you think, again, about a third of the food that is produced is never eaten by anyone, there is uh, unhoused people, not for lack of houses, right? Because we create a system in which people are excluded from the right to a home. Um, the same example I gave with clothes. Uh, we don't produce clothes for our needs. We don't produce clothes that are even good quality. It's just they are fitting a very particular process of extraction and expansion of the colonial frontiers of capitalism. You know, and we could make a historical reading of each and every of the things that we consider are satisfying. I'm talking about like basic needs here, right? And it expands to everything else. So once you see that we aren't really doing that, you can see like how wasteful our system actually is and how little it serves like having um, prosperous lives. And I think that, that for me, it's um, the key insight that, that, um, that from, from, the, from Degro that is often overlooked. Um, and also, um, which maybe is like my personal approach to this, to, to understand the problem of productivism not as a technical problem or not even an economic problem, but as a moral problem, in the sense of we have constructed this, this sense of worth, not because it's more efficient that we put our value on work. Like this is not the case, and, and we often uh, value work in itself, and, and we value uh, the suffering that has to go into work in itself uh, as, as providing, uh, as giving testimony of who we are. And I think we probably all of us have experienced that either in our own lives or in the life stories of our parents or family. So I think questioning that, uh, it's again, and here maybe I answer to what uh, Olga said, this is where I think the key to transformation is. If we dare uh, denaturalizing those concepts that for us seem impossible to change and imagine different collectives that take care of each other in different ways and we just get rid of that frame uh, from the neoclassical economic schools that now are the hegemonic ones. I think that's where the more radical, uh, radical change um, relies. So okay, I'm going to leave it there for now. Gabriela, do you have a question for Costas? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, going back to this, um, like, how how do you address this this idea of of producing for needs? Like, do you do you recognize now that we we have a system of provision that is not necessarily serving the needs of people? And yeah, like, how how do you, do you take that critique in particular? Costa. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I leave your question uh, last. <laughs> Okay. 
I leave your question, as I said uh, last, because it's uh, quite uh, complex. Uh, now, uh, about the cities uh, and uh, how we live uh, in cities. Of course, there are many people who prefer to live in a small village. There are uh, uh, everywhere in the planet movements, uh, organized cooperatives, and so on. Uh, I know a person uh, who lives in uh, North Italy and works in London. He lives in a cooperative and uh, they have better economy also. Uh, but he travels uh, every week by plane uh, in London for two days a week to work there. And he is in his own local community, having direct contacts with people, personal uh, relations more closed. But at the same time, he pollutes because he travels by plane going every, uh, every week uh, in London and return back. Uh, uh, what I mean by this example, I mean that uh, our uh, way of life is so complex uh, and uh, uh, we in the planet are so many, uh, more than 7 billion people, uh, and cities uh, uh, safeguard uh, uh, economies of scale and we can uh, satisfy our complex needs because we live together with many other people. Uh, health services, education, uh, which will become more expensive and are more expensive in uh, uh, small communities, except if we will agree that they are, they are not, they are valuable needs, they are not real needs. If we accept that everything of uh, the products we consume in our life are just uh, false needs, valuable needs, and uh, the, our uh, real needs are not that. Our uh, real needs is to communicate, to have a company to discuss, to, uh, to uh, have uh, less food, not standard, but differentiated, produced in local communities, and in home kitchens, not uh, ready food. Uh, and uh, uh, we are satisfied of uh, this uh, way of life, and all people are satisfied of this way of uh, life, then it's okay. But this means that many people, millions of people, must change their way of living, their everyday activities. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if they are satisfied with uh, uh, basic income uh, at the level it can be uh, safeguarded for all people all over the planet. You know, uh, increase the per capita income uh, these days after the crisis is about uh, uh, 14, no, uh, 17,000 uh, euros per year per one person, the medium uh, available income. In Germany, uh, is, uh, if I remember well, uh, about uh, 30,000 uh, euros per year per person. In uh, India, it's less than uh, 400 uh, euros per year. Uh, if uh, all Indians, all Chinese people, all sub sahara people have to increase their consumption level and the consumption of goods to become quite equal with us, then the total production of the planet must increase. Otherwise, we must decrease a lot our consumption. And uh, the developed world has much more less people that consume much more uh, goods uh, comparing with uh, uh, the poor countries. Uh, are we ready to accept that our needs are not what we think now in our everyday uh, day life uh, that are uh, the proper needs for our life and we must not consume so many goods uh, every day in order to live uh, in another society uh, uh, 
without having all these facilities, no, even now we consume electricity. Uh, uh, if we want not to consume so much electricity and energy, we must change all our everyday activities. Uh, uh, and th this is not an easy task, and uh, I don't think that most people want uh, this. Uh, so it depends, of course, on what we think are human needs. I have no answer to this, because human needs depends on what uh, we learn and how we uh, became, uh, become adults. Uh, because we learn our needs from our home, from our community, and from advertisements. And economy, economists say that, uh, and uh, the market also says that uh, our uh, needs are unfinished. Just we, we don't know that we have some needs. And that advertisement and marketing reminds us that we have some needs, a, a new laptop. And we are not satisfied with the old uh, PCs and laptops that are not so quick, and so on. Are we uh, okay with uh, our old ones? My first one was uh, in 1993 and was so uh, low that I can't stand with uh, it. And uh, uh, of course, there are many needs that uh, we don't need them. Uh, 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 they are not uh, real needs, they are false needs, but there is no uh, truth answer to what are our uh, real needs. It depends on our ideology, on our uh, values. Uh, for me, basic income uh, is based in one uh, global human uh, value, that is uh, human dignity. And uh, uh, basic income is... Uh, a human right, and we must uh, penetrate this uh, as a basic uh, human right to give us a chance to to make choices. But we don't know what type of choices all people, when they get uh, basic income, uh, will do. But uh, we must give that right to everyone, and, and this is uh, a necessary precondition for sustainability, but not a sufficient precondition for sustainability. It's the first step. Uh, that's why I put it as a pre-distributive and not uh, a redistributive policy. And of course, must be combined with a reduction of uh, working time, must be a political program, and I'm coming to advocacy now, there must be a political program combining uh, basic income, uh, generous reduction of working time, and uh, the erasement of uh, debts. Because if we give people that owe a lot of money to banks or creditors, uh, then they will use basic income to reduce their uh, debt, and they will not satisfy their needs. It, uh, uh, a sustainable world and social cohesion can be promoted if basic income as a political project will be combined with uh, the proposal for uh, the generous reduction of uh, working time and uh, the generous erasement of uh, debts. Thank you, Kostas, um, for dwelling and elaborating this topic, putting forward different factors. Uh, you've analyzed them uh, extremely correctly. And you concluded your lecture, the analysis of your topics, in the way you have. Uh, began earlier that this is a prerequisite uh, in terms of basic income and of course you answered Olga's uh, question meaning where do we start from 
because cost of stress that the basic income is one of the three conditions that need to be in place moving into the future for a sustainable life and this confirms somehow the concept of breakthrough we need a breakthrough to move forward we can't have all the, those changes overnight the basic income can be the starting point a critical one and a breaking through one so this is a main a critical conclusion that we need to bear in mind and we can move forward with the second round of questions your name please Cornilakis Andreas. Well, my understanding is that basic income is co connected with a shift of values of our society towards other standards, models, uh, referring to consumption and production. Well, do you believe that this can apply, can be implemented in the specific capitalistic model we experience and that could produce results without this shift of principles or rather it is required to have a change in the system first? And again, a second question, how would the basic income uh, how would it be funded in the first and the second case? Any other question? Daniel. On live streaming? No. Okay, Daniel, your question. Go ahead. Some activity online. I have also a question. Um, you both basically said that, uh, um, yeah, we need to move away from the way we think we we, we uh, work with large systems that, that we hold for, uh, yeah, uh, evident that we got got used to um, in in order to move to basic income, but I wonder what do we need to make this move? What do people need to realize that this move is necessary? I mean, just when we see the current events, uh, we've known for decades that we can't go on uh, um, with, with the produ production of greenhouse gases. Uh, we've known for ages, uh, scientists like you have been telling us for ages uh, that, that yeah, we cannot build our future on cheap gas and it needs apparently uh, such a conflict like uh, uh, the war in Ukraine now uh, to make people and governments uh, to realize um, yeah, that change is necessary and it's urgent and uh, it needs to be accelerated. So I wonder what needs to happen uh, to, to make us move towards basic income and other uh, measures that are necessary for a su sustainable future. Gabriella, you can answer. I can answer, it's a bit of an overstatement because I, can, I obviously can't answer that question because that's like the question that has it all, all of us here together this evening, right? Like, I, I always say if, if we knew the answer to that question, we would have done it already. So we clearly don't know and that's okay. Like we need to start from that um, sense of, you know, we, we have to figure this out. This has to be our greatest collective art act of political imagination and creativity. This, this moment, you know, is, uh, we, we have a window of time to make this and, 
and we'll have to make up something something new. Um, and just to mention briefly, because this is um, a question that comes up often also in the degrowth context, um, this is like a classical debate. So some people say, oh, you know, you have to uh, capture political institutions or like, you know, reform the state and from there uh, promote, put some, some policies in place like basic income, basic services, things like that. And then, you know, gradually we move towards that society. And there is another uh, position which is more of we have to create the alternatives outside existing political uh, spaces of political and economic power, you know, the prefigurative option in which the, the idea is, you know, we are going to create this world and when everyone else sees this is much better and it actually works, then the other institutions will just be meaningless and pointless and will lose that grip that they have on all of us. So, I mean, these are just like, you know, there's no way of, 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 of judging which one is going to work. I think uh, history has uh, examples of how these two ways of moving and transforming can happen. So I guess uh, it's up to us how we decide what of these moves makes more sense in our communities, in the places we inhabit, and which kind of, of political life we want to commit to. Um, and that also is going to the previous question of what goes first, I guess, whatever we can put first goes first. Like it's, uh, you don't get to choose your ideal political circumstances. You just get to um, make your bets as high as possible. I think that's like my personal uh, take at least. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I can say about that. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think I, I, um, the two questions are kind of approaching the same. Um, I mean, the, the answer to the first question is, uh, yes, I do believe it is possible to change that in our current very terrible capitalist order if, if we didn't believe it. Um, it would be really hard to, I don't know, be here and, and uh, advocate for, for doing uh, nice things and, and collective things. And for me, the biggest gift of anthropology has been precisely that, that, um, you know, every society has believed that the value system that they inhabit is the only one and the obvious one. And for centuries and millennia, many people lived under regimes that were, you know, absolute. They were divine, literally. And somehow one day everything fell apart, you know, and, and the day before that happens, it seems impossible. The day after it happens, it seems inevitable. So, you know, you never know when such moment is around the corner. It's, it might not be the planned revolution we would all like it to be, but we definitely are going to face moments in which social transformation will come at our doorstep and we'll have to put some ideas forward. So that's like the invitation I can do in answer to that question. Thank you, Gabriela Costas. Uh, I, I remember when I was young, I was uh, studying Karl Marx and I was uh, reading Capital and uh, Marx was referring to the movement of the charters. It was the first movement in England, in industrial England, people that was demonstrating demanding education, less working time, better payment. And uh, what is this? A better life. Uh, there were fighting demonstrations and uh, some of these demands satisfied nearly 50 years later. Uh, uh, the right to vote also was part of these demands. Uh, when they were uh, demonstrating, they were believing that uh, they have the right to demand them and, uh, as human beings. And uh, they raised in public debate uh, their demands. This means that 
what they thought was their problem as poor people is a social problem and to be recognized as a social problem. So uh, uh, my opinion is that, uh, of course, there, are there must be many changes in the world. The production system, of course, must change. Uh, but this is mainly a problem of power uh, relations. And uh, power relations change only if there are social movements. And not only there are social movements, but these movements are aligned uh, to some concrete political goals. That's the way the power elites uh, permit people to gain a better life or to change the way society is organized. Uh, but in order to have a movement, uh, first of all, uh, we can't wait until there will be a huge movement, a global movement, to support, to advocate basic income. There are, uh, this takes many years. Uh, and, uh, of course, basic income will not change the power relations at once. Uh, it will take also uh, many years. Uh, but uh, I remember also Keynes, who wrote, that in the long run, all we will be dead. This means that until the system will change rapidly, let's see what can we do to make our lives better today. And for me, basic income is the first necessary step. And in order to become an institutional step, we must recognize as people uh, and uh, basic income must be recognized as a human right, a basic human right. This is the first precondition. And this must be a goal. Uh, the second goal is to make this uh, awareness, this uh, recognition, a public debate. Only if needs of people uh, become uh, public debated, uh, only the, then uh, there is a movement. So this is uh, a second uh, step uh, I think is uh, necessary. And the third one is uh, the movement, the disintegrated movement in different areas nowadays and in the initiatives to support the goal of a basic income uh, must, in a way, become more aligned and make alliances with other similar movements. Of course, the European initiative, national initiatives, uh, BN, are initiatives uh, coordinated, but uh, co coordination is the first step. The second step is this coordination to become uh, more concrete activities. And, uh, of course, uh, to, to make the demand for the right to basic income uh, a public debate in mass media, in, uh, in, uh, in, in demonstrations, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, to be also part of the political debate. In uh, to, to be discussed in political parties, alternative or uh, mainstream political parties. Uh, and uh, for this reason, uh, uh, the uh, initiatives uh, of basic income must make alliances with other uh, movements, the movement for the reduction of uh, working time and so on because uh, everyday people have only their organizational power as uh, a mechanism for changing their lives. They have no money. Basic income will increase their chance for a dignified life and will give them more opportunities to fight for a better life. That's why I believe that it's an emergency to support 
basic income nowadays, not the future, it is affordable from our societies. It, it needs to rebalance uh, our resources between us. And this is not an easy task because it's a power uh, relation uh, and uh, provocation, this. This proposal provokes the power elites. I think uh, that we are discussing uh, interesting things, uh, but this is uh, the end of this uh, discussion. I think that the question set by Mr. Kornilakis, if I'm not mistaken, about financing will be the focal point of this three-day conference, the seminars and the workshops. Because, and I need to remind you here what you might have seen, in uh, uh, the web page uh, of the organization, I need to remind you that there are uh, three basic pillars uh, that uh, are part of all these sessions or workshops. The first pillar, basic income and money, discusses financing uh, of basic income. The second pillar is advocacy in favor of basic income, discusses on how to promote and put pressure in order to adopt this proposal. And the third pillar is called basic income and psychology and uh, discusses on how basic income influences uh, our mentalities, ethical behavior. Uh, so, Mr. Kornelakis all the, and all those who are attending us uh, via live streaming are invited uh, to follow the workshop and sessions, the workshops and sessions of the next two days, and if not, please follow the open discussion similar to this one uh, on Saturday evening. Thank you all very much for being here with us, uh, all those who are live with us or those who are attending via uh, live streaming. Thank you all to the speakers and the attendants. And uh, hopefully uh, soon uh, the pandemic and uh, the flu will be over. Uh, that Hopefully we would have more people uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic and the flu. But even though with this hybrid uh, system we managed to have a lot of people attending here.